Hey, what's going on everyone? In this video, we're going to get started with the math that's used in backpropagation during the training of an artificial neural network. So let's get to it. In our last video on backpropagation, we covered the intuition behind what backpropagation's role is during the training of an artificial neural network. Now we're going to focus on the math that's underlying backprop. The math is pretty involved, and so we're going to break it up into bite-sized chunks across a few videos. We're going to start out in this video by first quickly recapping how backpropagation is used during the training process. Then we'll jump over to the math side of things and open the discussion by going over the notation and definitions that we'll be using for our backprop calculations going forward. And this is going to be the main focus of this video, these definitions in the notation. The math underlying backprop all relies heavily on what we'll get introduced to here, so it's crucial that these things are understood before moving forward. Lastly, we'll narrow our focus to discuss the several indices that this notation depends on. All right, let's begin. Let's recap how backpropagation fits into the training process. We know that after we forward propagate our data through our network, that the network gives us an output for that data. The loss is then calculated for that predicted output based on what the true value of the original data is. Stochastic gradient descent, or SGD, has the objective to minimize this loss. To do this, it calculates the derivative of the loss with respect to each of the weights in the network. It then uses this derivative to update the weights. And it does this process over and over again until it's found a minimized loss. We cover how this update is actually done using the learning rate in our previous video that covers how a neural network learns. So when SGD calculates the derivative, it's doing this using backpropagation. So essentially, SGD is using backprop as a tool to calculate the derivative, or the gradient, of the loss function. Going forward, this will be our focus. All the math that we'll be covering in the next few videos will be for the sole purpose of seeing how backpropagation calculates the gradient of the loss function with respect to the weights. Okay, we've now got our refresher of backprop out of the way, so let's now jump over to the math. All right, I'm going to have to go full nerd on you guys and pull out my mathematics scientific notebook that you see on the screen here to show everything properly. We're going to start out by going over the definitions and notation that we'll be using going forward to do our calculations. So let's get started here. We start out by defining big L as the number of layers in the network. Layers are indexed sequentially as L equals one all the way up to big L. The nodes in a given layer L are indexed as J equals zero all the way up to N minus one. And the nodes in a previous layer, which would be L minus one, are indexed as K equals zero up to N minus one. When we're referring to a layer L, the indices that we're going to be using to refer to those nodes are going to be J indexed. And when referring to the layer L minus one, that's directly preceding L, the nodes in that layer are going to be K indexed. So moving on to the next definition, we then define Y sub J as the desired value of node J in the output layer big L for a single training sample. So given that we have labeled training data, we know ahead of time the output that we desire for any given input. And so Y sub J here is the desired value of some given input for a particular node J in the output layer. Next, we define C sub zero as the loss function of the network for a single training sample, which is going to be the sum of squared errors here. And actually, just like in our previous video, our discussion here is mostly going to be focused around passing one single training sample into the network at one time and seeing how backpropagation works in that regard. And then the logic that we build up here will be able to generalize to when we pass more than one training sample at a time. 
Next we have W sub JK superscript small l. Note that this is a superscript, it's not an exponent. And this is equal to the weight of the connection that connects node K in layer L minus one to node J in layer L. And you can see that in this illustration here. Next, we define W sub J superscript small l. And this is the vector that contains all the weights connected to node J in layer L by each node in layer L minus one. So we can see by our illustration here how this definition differs from the last one that we just defined. The last one was for one specific weight that connected two nodes in two separate layers together. And the definition that we just gave is an accumulation in vector format that contains all the weights connected to this specified node J in layer L by each node in the previous layer L minus one. Moving on, we now define Z sub J superscript small l as the input for node J in layer L. We know that each node within a layer receives a weighted sum of input from the previous layer. This weighted sum is being represented by this Z sub J superscript L here. Next, we define G superscript L as the activation function that's used for layer L. So after a node receives input, like that that we just defined in the previous definition, it's then going to pass this input to an activation function. And we're using this G superscript L here to represent that activation function for a given layer L. And finally, we define A sub J superscript small L as the activation output of node J in layer L. So what do we get after we pass our input from a node into the activation function. That's going to be the activation output that's then passed on to the next layer. And so we're representing that with this A sub J superscript L here. All right, so these are all the definitions that you need to know before moving forward. Now let's narrow in and discuss the indices used in these definitions a bit further. Recall at the top of our notebook, we covered the notation that we'd be using to index the layers and nodes within our network. All further definitions then depended on these indices. We saw that for each of the terms we introduced, we have either a subscript or a superscript or both. And sometimes our subscript even had two terms as we saw when we defined the weight between two nodes. So these indices that we're using everywhere may make the terms look a little intimidating and overly bulky. That's why I want to focus on this topic further here. It turns out that if we use these indices properly and we understand their purpose, they're going to make our lives a lot easier going forward when working with these terms and will reduce any ambiguity or confusion rather than induce it. You may be familiar with in code when we run loops like a for loop or a while loop that the data the loop is iterating over is an indexed sequence of data. Indexed data allows the code to understand where to start, where to end, and where it is at any given point in time within the loop itself. This idea of keeping track of where we are during an iteration over a sequence is precisely why keeping track of which layer, which node, which weight, or really which anything that we introduced here is important. In the math in the upcoming videos, we'll be seeing a lot of iteration, particularly via summation, where summation is simply the addition of a sequence of numbers. So a summation is just the process of iterating over a sequence of values and then summing them. Aside from iteration, anytime we choose a specific item to work with within our network, like a particular layer, node, weight, etc., the indexing that we introduce here is what's going to allow us to properly reference this particular item that we've chosen to focus on. As it turns out, backpropagation itself is an iterative process. Iterating backwards through each layer, calculating the derivative of the loss function with respect to each weight for each layer. So given all of this, it should be clear why these indices are required in order to make sense of the math going forward. And hopefully, rather than causing confusion within our notation, these indices can instead become intuition for when we think about doing anything iterative over our network.
All right, now we have all the mathematical notation and definitions we need for backprop going forward. At this point, take the time to make sure you fully understand this notation and the definitions and that you're comfortable with the indexing that we talked about. After you have all this down, you'll be prepared to take the next step. In our next video, we'll be using these definitions to make some mathematical observations regarding things that we already know about the training process. These observations are going to be needed in order to progress to the relatively heavier math that comes into play when we start differentiating the loss function in order to calculate the gradient using backprop. Thanks for watching. See you next time.